Thank you everybody for being here. I'm super delighted to get to be part of this awesome event. Um, so I'm really interested in the question of how we can use reinforcement learning to help improve people's lives. Um, and I think that right now we've seen sort of um, a historic period for reinforcement learning. And many of the places we've been seeing some incredible advances have been things like video games and robotics, which all have some really amazing um, success stories. But I think when we start to think about reinforcement learning that is designed to interact with people, um, a number of important challenges come up. And in particular, the fact is that reinforcement learning algorithms work by learning through experience. And that means that the experience that they acquire, if these are systems to interact with people, um, is going to be uh, in some ways high stakes or valuable in the sense that we need to think about how that data is gathered um, and how this might impact the individuals that are interacting with these reinforcement learning systems. And so in my work and in my lab's work, we try to think about the full technical stack of questions that arises when we think about using reinforcement learning systems to help improve people's lives. And some of this ends up looking sort of like what the normal reinforcement learning paradigm is of where we have an agent uh, here represented by a computer that's taking actions that here are, is going to interact with a person. A person is going to be our, our state of the world. Um, and then we get back some reward and some states. And to some extent, this is sort of the standard reinforcement learning setting. Um, Markov decision processes fit into this. And when I teach my reinforcement learning class, this is sort of the basic setup that we think about. But as I have sort of thought more about how these systems are going to be used when they interact with people, I think about something that looks much more like the following, um, where we think about there being this sort of standard classic reinforcement learning box, but then that there's a number of important additional questions and challenges that come up. So in particular, obvious things in terms of things like exploration efficiency um, and counterfactual reasoning about how we can use old data to make better decisions come up. But then there are also really important questions around how do we define these action spaces, how do we define the state spaces, and what type of rewards are we optimizing? So Chaba had a lovely talk earlier um, where he talked about this issue of where do these rewards come from and the complexities of specifying these rewards. In many of the cases that I think about, I think about things involving healthcare and educational systems. And in those settings, often humans are designing the rewards, but there are many possible reward choices. And in general, there's a huge amount of challenges here um, when we think about sort of this complex objective function that an RL agent might be trying to help someone manage. There's challenges around misspecification and adversaries and robustness and multi-objectives, as well as the fact that humans are embedded in a much richer, complicated world, and whatever RL agent we have is only going to be part of what is influencing them. But today, um, because particularly the focus is thinking about aspects of the intersection between reinforcement learning and controls, I wanted to just talk about one particular effort that we've been doing recently of thinking about risk-sensitive reinforcement learning. Uh, and so I'm just going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on one algorithm today and sort of step through some of our recent progress on that. So what is risk-sensitive reinforcement learning and why might it be important? So risk-sensitive reinforcement learning is going to have us think about the fact that we don't generally care just about the expected returns. Why don't we care just about expected returns? Well, I live in California. Um, we've been experiencing a large number of wildfires. Um, but whether you care about wildfires or you care about stock market portfolio optimization, most individuals are only going to experience a single trajectory in their life. And so for individuals, risk sensitivity is very important. We know that people are loss averse, um, and we know that they are not generally thinking about expected outcomes, but they're thinking about risk sensitive outcomes. And so from the perspective of creating these systems, whether it's for um, stock markets or insurance or healthcare, we would like to be thinking about algorithms that could, sit, could consider risk sensitive outcomes. But equally important is that even if you are an organization or an institution that gets to experience many returns or many outcomes, um, a lot of these institutions, including the government, care about things like equity and fairness. And so if we care about equity and fairness, then we care about the full distribution of returns that is going to be experienced by all the population involved. Um, and we generally don't care just about expected outcomes. So, for example, in the education space that I think a lot about, you could just want to optimize for the average test score of a student, but that could be achievable by having half the population get 100% and half the population failing. 
if 50% is the, is the maximal possible average. So that would generally consider to be um, not an acceptable solution in our society um, because we care about thinking about what's the distribution of outcomes that any individual might encounter. So when we think about risk-sensitive reinforcement learning, there's a couple different main paradigms that we've seen in the past. Um, one is uh, sort of still the reinforcement learning setting, but it avoids exploration. So I put up here a classic example of machine repair, which is one of sort of these quintessential examples where you might want to do risk sensitivity. Um, you could think about operating some expensive equipment that can break down over time. Um, and uh, so at each time point here, this is a series of states. You can either continue to operate the machinery or you can replace it. And there's going to be some stochastic failure rate. And you want to think about designing a policy that is going to optimize for a risk-sensitive distribution instead of the expected outcome or expected cost. So this is a very classic example where we care about risk sensitivity and controls and decision making. And one of the most, perhaps one of the most common areas to think about reinforcement learning and risk is if we're given data about you know, the system itself, about the stochastic system, can we plan a safe policy? So here I'm going to think about safe policies as being risk-sensitive policies, policies that are going to optimize for some sort of subset of the distribution of returns. And in this case, these algorithms are not acting online. They're not trying to deal with the exploration exploitation challenge, but they are trying to compute a safe policy. And there's a huge body of literature on this type of challenge um, going back decades, and also um, a number of nice works more from the reinforcement learning community. So that's the first type of places where I think we've seen extensive um, understanding of how to do risk sensitive decision making, given the fact that we only get to observe information about the world through um, experience. So a second case where we're seeing a lot of excitement, um, and I think there's some really beautiful work, is where we're doing safely learning a safe policy. So there's a large number of people in the reinforcement learning community that are thinking about this, including um, Shai Minor and other people in this room. Um, I think Shai is going to talk a little bit about some of this work probably tomorrow. And, and what does this mean? So this means that in many cases we have systems where things are incredibly high stakes and a single failure could in fact break the system and stop learning entirely. So in the case of drones, this being sort of one of the quintessential examples, um, if you do uh, very risky exploration, you can break your drone. And so then all learning stops and you can't proceed. And so in these incredibly high stakes environments, we need to think really carefully, not about just learning a good risk sensitive policy, but about doing so in a way that is self safe, because we can't tolerate failure um, during the learning process. And so there's been a, a number of different really interesting approaches to this, including using sort of Bayesian networks and Gaussian, uh, uh, Gaussian processes. But I think that this has um, sort of ignores another type of risk sensitive reinforcement learning, which I think is also important, which is quickly learning a safe policy. So in some cases, we're not in the scenario where it's incredibly high stakes and a single uh, decision that's bad could actually halt the system, um, but we do care about learning a safe policy. So you could think about something like um, nudges to help people uh, you know, improve their exercise or improve their wellness. So in these types of scenarios, you would like to be data efficient. You would like to quickly learn these policies. You get to explore online. Um, but a single mistake isn't catastrophic. If you don't give the exact right nudge today and people forget to go to their run, it is not a catastrophic outcome. But you'd like to sort of optimize and, and help people sort of manage their wellness well over time. So I think that there's a huge body of applications that fall in this third camp where um, you may not require safe exploration, but you do want to learn a safe policy. And in these cases, I think we haven't really thought very much about how do we do this quickly. We thought a lot about fast exploration in other domains where we're optimizing for expected outcomes, but much less so when we're trying to optimize for risk sensitive outcomes. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is some of the um, initial work we've been doing there. I just want to highlight, too, that there's been some nice initial work on this for bandits as well, again, including Chai Minor's group. Uh, but I'm going to focus here on the decision making for sequential settings. So before we get started, um, I'm just going to do a really quick notation overview. I know most everybody knows this, but sometimes in different communities we use different notations. So I'm going to use S to denote state, uh, pi to denote a policy that is a mapping from states to actions. I'm going to focus on the Markov setting. Um, 
we're going to assume that we have an input reward, which is a function of state in action, and then we can represent the value function as the expected discounted sum of rewards. So this right now is not incorporating any notion of risk sensitivity or distributions. This is just the standard representation for the Bellman operator if we're doing policy evaluation. So what I mean by policy evaluation here, just to recap, is that I'm assuming that the decision policy has been fixed, and then I'm estimating that by performing these backups. Now, in the reinforcement learning setting, we're going to generally assume we don't know the dynamics and don't know the reward, and so we're only going to be able to observe these through the samples from the environment. So one important thing that we wanted to build on is to look at distributional reinforcement learning, um, because we're going to be interested in doing risk-sensitive reinforcement learning and thinking about outcomes that are sort of in the worst-case percentage of the distribution. So, if we think about distributional RL for policy and control, um, this, these ideas have been around a long time, but nice work by Mark, Delamere, Mark Bellamere and some other colleagues have been sort of lifting these ideas to the deep reinforcement learning setting recently. So what we could think of here is um, this would be the distribution of returns under a policy. So this is a discretized representation of that, where we've made sort of a histogram of what are the different returns and what are the probabilities of those that we would expect to get. Um, under following a particular policy. Now, how would we estimate this? Well, if we have a particular policy, we could do something like Monte Carlo rollouts. We could just run that policy many times. We would look at all the returns that we get, and then we could estimate our histogram from that. But there's a couple downsides of that. Um, one is that uh, we don't think that that's necessarily going to be the most efficient approach, computationally or data efficient way to do that. And secondly, that may not help us when we want to start to make control decisions about what policy we should be running. And so to help address this, um, what uh, Mark Bellamere and his colleagues did is they introduced the distributional Bellman policy evaluation operator. So, what I'm denoting here um, by P pi is the transition model you get if you assume that you're following policy pi. So you can imagine taking your previous distribution and sort of transforming it by um, multiplying in the dynamics operator. And then you could shrink that distribution by incorporating a contraction factor um, from the discount factor with the Bellman operator. And then we shift it over by the current reward. And then finally, um, the new set of uh, reward distributions we have, we're going to assume in general that we need some representation of the distribution of outcomes. And there are multiple different ways to do this, but one common way to do this is to have a fixed um, sort of discrete representation of the distribution of rewards. And so then after we do the shifting operator, we're going to have to project it down. So this is their prior work. This is the distributional Bellman policy evaluation operator. And I think it's a really nice graphical depiction of what this is doing. We're now, instead of maintaining a scalar for each state about what is the expected discounted sum of future awards, we're maintaining essentially a histogram over all the possible returns we could get and their probabilities from a single state. And then when we do a Bellman backup, then we have to do the shifting, adding in the reward, and then projecting back down. And I know we'll have time for questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt me during this if any of this is unclear. Okay. So this is um, the distributional Bellman Blessy policy evaluation operator, um, but this doesn't yet tell us how we could maybe do this for control. So when I say control in this case, what I mean is that we would really like to be taking some sort of max operator in this case, something with respect to these distributions, um, so that we could actually figure out what is the optimal way to act when we care about some statistic of the distribution of returns. So unfortunately, it turns out that there's some reason uh, to think that this might be quite challenging, particularly if we care about theoretical results. So um, if we look at what a new distributional operator might be here, uh, we could think of now incorporating a max operator. Um, we'd have to define what this max operator is doing. Um, one, op uh, one opportunity would be to say, we still want to maximize the expected discounted sum of returns, but while we're doing that, we also want to maintain a distribution of outcomes. So I think this distinction is important to think about. So one thing that we're doing with distributional RL right now is we're saying we're going to maintain a full histogram of outcomes. 
So instead of a scalar, which just represents the mean, we're going to have our full distribution of outcomes. So that's one change compared to standard RL. And then the second question is, how are we going to take actions? And what Mark and his colleagues thought initially about is, look, we still actually care about the same objective function, but we also want to maintain the full distribution of outcomes. So you're going to end up with a policy that might look the same as Q-learning, but I want to be able to know what my distribution of outcomes would be. So um, one thing they looked at there is to say, well, can we have any sort of sanity guarantees over what this type of um, uh, operator, this new distributional Bellman operator, would be in that case? And they looked in particular at the maximal form of the Wasserstein metric on two distributions to try to quantify how different two distributions are. So in this case, um, Z here would represent your distribution over returns from starting in state X and taking action A, and Z2 would be a different distribution of returns. So again, just to connect it back to standard RL, normally that would have been two Q functions. Those both would have been scalars, and we just would have subtracted them um, or maybe taken an L1 norm. Now these are two distributions for any input state and action, and we want to look at how far they are. And the challenge that they noticed is that even if the way we're taking actions is the same as before, meaning that we're still just wanting to maximize the expected discounted sum of returns, um, if we apply this sort of distributional RL backup operator, it is not a contraction. And that should be quite concerning to us because um, in general, when we do proofs about the fact that providing Bellman backup operators is going to be guaranteed to get us to a fixed point solution, the thing that we rely on is that this Bellman backup operator is a contraction. And the problem here is, and notice this is a problem even if we're in the tabular case, we're not necessarily even thinking about um, function approximation yet, but even if in the tabular case, um, this may no longer be a contraction. So that means that um, even if the way we're going to take actions is the same as before, this sort of distributional metrics are a little bit more subtle for us to think about, and it's not clear yet exactly how we're going to handle these and be a guarantee to get to sort of convergence and fixed points. So in general, this suggests that convergence results might be hard and finite sample results might be harder than that. So this is just to illustrate that once we move to the distributional RL case, even before we start thinking about sort of quickly learning, um, our understanding of these is still quite limited about um, what sort of convergence guarantees might be possible even before we get to the function approximation setting. Yeah? Uh, when you say it's not a contraction, it's not a contraction when you use Wasserstein. That's right. That's right. Uh, is it the one we did in your book, like using other means of this stuff? Great question. So the question was to say, I, I said it's not a contraction with this particular maximal norm form <laughs> of the Wasserstein. Is it known whether or not it's a contraction in other distances? Um, I believe for mo many metrics, it is not thought to be a contraction, um, but whether people have sort of exhaustively went through all of them, I don't know. It's a great question. All right. But we, we're going to try to persist. Why are we going to try to persist? Well, even though we don't have convergence guarantees for this, there's a number of nice empirical papers that suggest that in practice, um, we can use distributional RL and still end up with pretty good policies. In some ways, maybe this is not surprising. Um, in deep reinforcement learning, we still have fairly limited amounts of uh, theoretical results, and yet empirically, it often works quite well. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe we can't, we're not going to be able to get to strong theoretical results yet, but let's see if we can use these types of ideas and still start to move towards sample efficient learning. So we would like that these initial approaches were focusing on maximizing expected outcomes, but to us what we're really excited about for the distributional RL is that you had this full distribution of outcomes, and so you can optimize not just for expected outcomes, but for risk-sensitive outcomes. Okay. So, and in particular, the risk-sensitive outcome we're going to focus on is conditional value at risk. There's a lot of different risk-sensitive measures you might, be care you might care about. The reason that we pick CVAR is because it's a well-established notion in sort of the controls community and the finance community, um, and so we thought it would be a nice one to start with. So what is conditional value at risk? Well, let's just look at the orange um, distribution for a second. Imagine that this is the distribution of returns you get from a particular policy. So this is the full distribution. Um, this is the PDF. And so you would see that the mean of the PDF is here. What the conditional value at risk does is it looks at, for a particular input alpha, which is somewhere between 0 and 1, it looks at 
all of the distributions that lie between zero and alpha in terms of the probability of outcomes. So we're looking at sort of the um, cumulative distribution function there. And we're saying, what is the lowest alpha? So if alpha is 25, 0.25, then we're looking at the bottom 25% of the distribution. And then what CVAR does is it says, what is the average value in that bottom 25%? So it's sort of like saying the average value over the 25% you know, worst outcomes. And that's what we're going to optimize for. And we'll need to pick what alpha is. So alpha is a choice about essentially how risk sensitive you are. Smaller alpha is going to be more risk sensitive. As alpha goes towards zero, essentially you're maximizing for worst case outcomes. If you set alpha equal to one, you're maximizing for average outcomes. So it provides this nice continuum between things that are very risk, um, risk sensitive to things that are just looking at the standard expected outcomes. Okay. So what we want to do in this case is we want to do sample visual reinforcement learning to optimize this conditional value at risk. And for inspiration, what we're going to do is we're going to look back at, well, what would we do normally if we wanted to do sample efficient learning if we were just trying to maximize the expected outcomes? Because there's been a large body of literature on that. And so in particular, um, uh, in my group and a number of other groups, we've been thinking a lot about um, doing sample efficient learning in the expected case. So we're trying to, if you're trying to just ma uh, maximize for expected outcomes. And the key insight for those that has allowed us to get to sort of closing minimax bounds for regret impact learning for tabular episodic um, MDPs is optimism under uncertainty. So our intuition is, well, we now care about risk sensitivity, but maybe optimism under uncertainty could still be really helpful in that case. And so it's going to turn out that what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be optimistic to be conservative. And that's going to end up being as useful as it was when we were just trying to be optimistic to do average case. So in particular, I think it's helpful to look back at sort of how do you know, optimism under uncertainty for standard RL algorithms work. And this sort of basic template works for many different optimistic algorithms, um, whether you're looking at tabular cases or the function approximation setting. Because essentially what they do is they compute an optimistic estimate of your Q function, where now again, Q function is not distributional, it's just looking at average outcomes. And then we just select the action that maximizes that optimistic Q. Now, of course, the key he thing here is, well, how do you compute that optimistic Q? Um, and most of the work, um, at least certainly in the tabular case, but even um, many of the function approximation cases are inspired by the same idea, is to use some form of concentration inequality. So we, um, Hofting is a particular simple one. It doesn't give you optimal bounds, but um, essentially what we're trying to look at here is we've got some gap between the optimal Q function and our estimated one, and we want to bound away how far away those are. And we can use lots of different types of concentration inequalities to give us upper bounds on that. Why is that useful? Well, if we have an upper bound on this, then you can move the, expect, the estimated value over to the other side, and that gives you an upper bound on the true value, and you can use that to make decisions. So that's why these concentration inequalities are helpful if we want to do optimism under uncertainty. And so what we thought we could do is we said, well, why don't we sort of build on this insight and just make two small modifications so we can do this in, for risk sensitivity? So the two small um, modifications are, instead of getting an optimistic estimate of the Q value, we want to get an optimistic estimate of the distribution of Q values. And instead of taking an action that maximizes the expected value, we want to take an action that maximizes the C bar of this distribution. So there's just sort of two different steps that we're going we're gonna to change here. And of course, the key question is how we're going to do the first. In both cases, once you have figured out number one, um, getting an optimistic estimate of Q or an optimistic estimate of the distribution of Q, the second part of how to make action selections is quite easy. So fortunately, there are concentration inequalities for distributions. Um, in particular, the DKW concentration inequality gives us an upper and lower bound on the CDF of a function based on empirical data. So it's a little bit hard to see, unfortunately, here. Um, but this blue line would be what you would estimate the CDF was of a function um, with a limited amount of data. So you can imagine that the orange line is your true CDF of your function. That's unobserved. You have a limited amount of data. And so you'd get this sort of stepwise function that would be your empirical estimate. 
And what DKW does is it provides upper and lower bounds on that CDF. So those are the purple lines here. And that's great because now we're going to have concentration inequalities over the distribution of returns that we could get. And we can use those to be optimistic. So in particular, we're going to create sort of an optimistic estimate or an optimistic sort of distributional Bellman operator. And the idea is that we're going to start with a CDF of, for in our case, it's going to be of the returns. And then we're going to shift it. And we're going to shift it down. And I find that when I say shifting it down, it always seems somewhat counterintuitive because we want to be optimistic. So why are we shifting things down? Um, so I always have to remind myself personally um, that this is really moving all of that mass that we're losing at the bottom over to the most optimistic case. And I think that's a little bit easier to see in the PDF. So if we think about sort of our histogram or our PDF version of the CDF, what we're essentially doing here is when we shift down that CDF, we're taking that sort of bottom distributions and imagining that they were optimistic. So we're moving our lower mass of our distribution of returns and pretending that we always get the maximum value in those cases. And that's creating an optimistic distribution of returns. So that's, so that's really nice. So that allows us to get this optimism so that it provides a principled way for us to transform a distribution of returns into an optimistic distribution of returns. Now, the next question you might ask is, OK, great, but you know, how much should I move over? That seems like the critical part. If I move over a lot, then I'm going to be optimistic, but I might be wildly too optimistic. And so then I'm going to get way too much exploration. So very nicely, it turns out that the amount that you should shift is, but looks almost identical to what you would get for the normal sort of optimism operators. So for those of you that are familiar with optimistic RL, you'll be used to sort of seeing bonuses that look like one over the square root of the number of samples. Now, I'll, I'll say shortly how we're going to deal with this when we have an infinite set of states. But for right now, we can just think about the tabular case. So this shift is going to look almost identical to what we had before. Um, we're going to have something that's sort of looking at this range of Vmin and Vmax. Um, we're going to have a constant out front. I'll tell you in a second some, some ways we could specify that constant. And then we have a bonus that says, if you have a lot of data about this state action pair, you're going to have less optimism in terms of the shift. And so that means that asymptotically, you're not going to shift at all because you have lots of data. And so you're not going to need to change this, just like what we would get with standard optimism. OK, so this is what we do. And this is what we create for our optimistic algorithm. So we first compute an optimistic estimate of the distribution of the Q. We do this by transforming our CDF, or we can think of it as our PDF, um, by shifting it by a particular amount, which is to do with how many samples we have. And then after we do that, we take the action, we do that for each of the different actions. Here we're assuming that we have a finite number of actions. Um, and then we just select the action which max maximizes that C bar. So you might wonder whether or not this is a good thing to do, um, uh, particularly after I highlighted that we're not going to be able to get to sample complexity results yet, because we don't even know those for the standard distributional RL operator. But we have some theoretical reason or some theoretical justification for the fact that this particular procedure is a sound one. And in particular, what we analyze is the policy evaluation case similar to what's been done in the generic distributional uh, deep RL case. And what we say is that if you pick C in a way that's sort of a log of the size of the state in action space, um, and it only needs to be log versus linear in the state in action space um, because of some of the particular ways we construct the concentration inequalities, then we can show that applying this sort of optimistic operator um, converges and uh, it converges to an optimistic estimate of the true distribution of returns. So for no matter what alpha you pick, if you pick an alpha and you define this sort of optimistic operator and you repeat this a bunch of times, you will end up with a calculation that gives you an optimistic estimate of the conditional value at risk by using this particular kind of bonus or way of transforming the distribution. So that's useful. Um, it's not to the sample complexity results that we would like yet, but it gives us some assurances that this particular way of transforming the distribution not only leads to optimism, um, uh, but um, that we don't need too much optimism in order to ensure this. So you might have a couple concerns at this point. Um, uh, the resulting actions might not be safe. Yes. 
So we are not going to be able to guarantee that by following these types of policies that we will never take a bad action, nor that on a particular return we might do extremely badly. Um, there's going to be no guarantees on the return for an individual episode, um, so this is not safe exploration, and it will not be suitable for some really high-stakes situations. However, I'll return to sort of our empirical results to suggest that by trying to quickly learn a risk-sensitive policy, you are going to get some benefits in terms of safe exploration. And I'll go back to that in a second. And perhaps even more importantly, you might say, this is great, but we care about things that aren't just tabular, so how are we going to do this sort of optimistic distribution um, transformation when we have an infinite number of states? And for that, we can again be inspired by um, this work on distributional RL. So in this uh, distributional deep reinforcement learning work, we maintain a discretized representation of the distribution of returns. We're going to do the same thing. In our case, it's going to be an optimistic distribution of returns instead of an average case. And then what we can do is we can compute the CDF of the current distribution and we um, apply an optimism operator. Now this is where things have to change because we no longer have a discrete number of states and actions, which means we can't easily compute this um, the operator we had before. So recall, this is what our operator looked like before, where we had um, uh, the number of counts for a state action pair. But if we're in an infinite state space, then we're only going to have a single example of any particular state. And so what we can do here is we can use pseudo counts. So this has also been used for optimism under uncertainty um, in the standard sort of expected um, return case. And we can apply a similar insight here where we're going to be thinking about sort of um, changes in predictive accuracy to approximate how well we know this distribution. Because ultimately, these counts are trying to allow us to quantify what parts of the state space do we have a good understanding and what parts do we not, and then use that information to try to drive exploration. So we can do this. This actually has to be a little bit different um, than the standard approach, because we have to do all of these computations before we take actions. Um, uh, but I'm happy to talk about some of that offline. So we can apply this sort of modified optimism operator, and then we can again just choose the action that maximizes the C-bar value with respect to this optimistic um, Q value. And then once we do that, then we're going to update our optimistic distribution of returns. And we do this for state action reward next state tuples in sort of a Q-learning type fashion, um, uh, but lifted to this sort of distributional deep RL case. So this is the basic approach, and um, this allows us to be able to scale up to large domains. Um, and now I want to talk about how this actually works. So when we were thinking about um, our simulation experiments, we wanted to pick domains um, uh, which would involve continuous spaces as well as continuous spaces as well as discrete, um, but also where we thought that risk sensitivity might actually matter. So in many of the Atari games, it's not clear that risk sensitivity is particularly important because the experience is being generated by running Atari games, which is okay as long as you have large amounts of compute. So we were particularly interested in thinking about other domains where we think you'd want to compute a risk-sensitive policy. Um, I guess before I get into those particular examples, I'll just say briefly what the baseline algorithms are. So one is the same algorithm as what we're doing, but not doing optimism. So we just do E greedy with respect to an empirical estimate of the C-bar value. Um, the second is uh, the implicit quantile network work, um, uh, where they use an e-greedy method for exploration. Um, we used a particular dopamine implementation of this. This has been previously run um, to allow one to do risk learning of a risk-sensitive policy. And then finally, um, an actor-critic method, which maximizes the expected return while getting an inequality on the C-bar, um, where this relies on stochastic policies in order to do exploration. So what are the particular domains we looked at? Um, the first was machine repair. So this is this classic example um, uh, where, and in our case, we're assuming you only learn about it by trying actions out. So we're going to think about cases where we're in the episodic scenario. So we get to act for one episode, and then we reset, similar to the assumption that Chaba talked about earlier. I think that's realistic in many cases I think about in terms of healthcare um, or uh, customers or students. You sort of have a series of individual trajectories. Um, the second one is one, a simulator for structured treatment uh, for HIV. The idea is that you have a six-dimensional state that captures some of the important parameters of the patient. Um, and then the actions are just whether you start or stop treatment. 
There are multiple reasons why you might not always want to have treatment on. There are side effects. Um, it could have other um, potentially destabilizing aspects on the dynamics. So there are reasons in many cases why you might not always want to have treatment. And then the reward is a function of essentially how the patient's immune system is working. And then another example, which is a fairly new one, we've used it briefly in some of our previous work, um, but I haven't seen it used extensively, and I think it's a really nice example, is a diabetes blood glucose control simulator. This is now, there's now an open source version of this simulator, um, of a simulator that was improved by the FDA as a replacement for animal control trials. So that's really cool because that means there's a simulator that's high fidelity enough that the FDA had said if you can do well on this simulator, you don't have to do animal control trials when designing different treatments. Um, up to some caveats, of course, but I think that's really exciting. And so there's been now an open source implementation of that simulator. I don't know exactly if that would reach the same levels of standards as the FDA had for the original one, um, but I think that these are interesting motivating examples. So in this case, the simulator state is the blood glucose of the patient um, plus carb intake to look at sort of input from food. And then the action is different levels of um, injections for bolus insulin. So in this case, we looked at six different discrete levels. And then we used a reward function that had been def uh, defined before in 2014. BG here is blood glucose. And so you can think of sort of penalizing depending on if you're too far off from particular target range values of blood glucose. So I think this is a really nice example. It's um, open, uh, open and available, implemented not by our group, but others. But I think it's a great example. So how well do we do? Um, this is the machine repair example. Um, let me first just um, motivate that in this case, we do actually need to do something aside from maximizing expected rewards. Um, because in some cases, it might turn out that the best expected reward policy is the same as CVAR and then you don't really need to do any of what we're talking about. Um, what we see here is that on the y-axis is the CVAR performance, and what I put in gray is that if you just maximize for expected return, um, this is how well you do if you were evaluated on CVAR. And so this just illustrates that um, you would do worse if you were just trying to maximize as expected returns, so you can't just maximize for expected returns and hope to do well and be risk sensitive. What black shows here is the optimal CVAR policy for this domain, so it's substantially higher on this metric. And then we're comparing multiple algorithms. Our algorithm is in green, um, uh, the AC CVAR is down here, and then um, E greedy is in blue. I wanna be clear here that um, it's not entirely a fair comparison to look at this pink in the sense that this algorithm was not trying to do um, fast exploration wasn't designed for that, but it's one of the few algorithms that's trying to explicitly sort of learn these um, uh, CVAR style guarantees. So I think the important comparison here is to look between the green and the blue, which are basically just comparing the same type of algorithm except for one has optimism and one doesn't. And you can see here that we much more quickly converge to the risk sensitive policy compared to doing more simple exploration. Yeah. Great question. The question was to say, how sensitive is our algorithms to the definition of the constant C? In our theoretical analysis, we give a particular way to choose it. What we do for the empirical experiments is um, we optimize over the epsilon and we optimize over C. So there's a hyperparameter for each of the two algorithms and we optimize over both of them. So this is not a practical approach, right? It's not a what? Great question. So the question is, this is not um, a theoretical approach in the sense that you can't actually um, optimize this online. Yes, um, I, I completely agree. I'll talk a little bit about some places where I think we can do that in, in, uh, for one of the other domains in a second. That unfortunately is an issue for all existing RL algorithms. Um, uh, normally, if you use the constant that's defined from provable uh, optimism, it's way too overly optimistic. And so it's important for empirical performance to tune. But, but I think there are places we can get at that, so I'll talk about that in a second. Um, here's a second domain, this is the HIV treatment. This is where we've also done the comparison to IQN. Um, uh, again, in these cases that you can see, we can learn a policy much quicker um, than, uh, than uh, just doing sort of simpler exploration. Again, as you would hope, um, but it's nice to see that empirically this is true even when we optimize over the epsilon greedy schedules. <clears throat> 
And this is true also for the blood glucose simulator. Um, but I think uh, the nice thing about the blood glucose simulator is it also, it has different um, patients with different dynamics. So it has 10 different adults, and I think a number of children too, um, which have different types of dynamics um, in the simulator. And so what we could do in this case is try to address the question that was just brought up, which is you don't really wanna be doing tuning of the C parameter because the whole point is that um, you wanna be risk sensitive in a new domain. So what we did in this case is um, we took data from one of the adult patients and we optimized, we did hyperparameter optimization on that for epsilon and for um, our C parameter. And then we fixed those hyperparameters and we ran our algorithm with those chosen parameters on other domains. So in fact, this is not the adult that we um, did the hyperparameter tuning on. We did it on another one. And then we ran using those hyperparameters that were optimized from that held out patient for each algorithm and fix those hyperparameters for all of these. And so this was quite encouraging because this suggests that even if you've sort of chosen what that C should be or epsilon, then across a number of different other adults, we could see a significant gain of learning quickly. So in this case, we're not doing any hyperparameter tuning on these additional individuals. And you can see, as you might expect, that it varies. You know, um, on uh, adult four, we get sort of a modest improvement. Um, on adult three and adult five, we get a sizable improvement in how quickly we can learn. But I think that that suggests that in general, we seem to be pretty robust um, to, if you have some previous data to optimize with, you could set these parameters in a way that would allow one to do substantially fast learning, faster learning across a number of future individuals. So just to summarize this here, you know, in all three domains, optimism significantly sped the learning of the optimal CVAR policy. Um, some of you, particularly those of you who deal with robots, might still be concerned, look, but you're not making any guarantees. Like if I look at this over here, there's um, you know, a lot of up and down, and I'm not making any guarantees over the safe exploration during this process. But one thing that I wanna note here is that um, when we're significantly speeding learning, if we think about sort of the number of bad outcomes that can occur, if you can learn the optimal policy faster, then you should hopefully have less bad outcomes occur. And we can see that here empirically as well. So because we are learning faster um, and because of the way we're learning, so we're, we're trying to be optimistic about this sort of CVAR worst case, right? And we're taking policies that we think are gonna be good under those sort of worst case scenarios or CVAR worst case. Then we can compare to something like eGreedy and sort of the percentage of time that we're ending up in maybe not catastrophic events, but highly undesirable reward outcomes. And you can see that our approach substantially reduces that. And this is over an entire run. And so essentially this is just because we're trying to be principled in how we're exploring um, potentially good risk sensitive policies and we are faster at converging to those. And so you don't get safe exploration, but you get what I would call safer exploration. Um, you're gonna have less bad events. You know, for those individuals, they're gonna have less bad days of having their um, diabetes managed because we're getting there quicker and we're trying to prioritize things that we think are gonna be good. Um, just to, uh, before I conclude, I wanna highlight that there's a lot of open directions. I would really like to get sample complexity results for this case and be able to understand this more formally so that we could have sort of strong bounds on how much experience is needed in the safe exploration setting. Um, one thing that I think is quite interesting here is that I suspect when we achieve those, we or other groups achieve those, that the bounds will look very similar to the expected case, but I only expect to get a scaling of roughly maybe one over alpha in terms of how much more data is needed. So I think that that's that's very nice, essentially indicating you're not gonna have to pay too much to do um, risk sensitive learning compared to expected outcomes. Um, I think it'd be great to sort of have other ways to com combine with safe exploration. Um, and more generally, I'm, I'm very interested in this issue of how do we do sort of constrained robust learning um, and robustness to a number of different things, including the fact that um, in many cases, we're gonna have covariate shift or possibly some sort form of adversarial input. The adversarial input or misspecification here um, is not gonna be necessarily explicit adversary, but it might be due to the fact that these individuals are interacting with many other things that are influencing the reward function. And we want our algorithms to be robust to that. So just to summarize, I think we can be optimistic um, for to be conservative. Um, we can uh, sort of create an optimism operator um, over the distribution of returns that is simple to compute and is easy to um, incorporate into existing distributional deep RL algorithms. We happen to do it with C51 here, but it's sort of an additional, in some ways, orthogonal step that could be incorporated with many of the other recent advances. Um, 
and it enabled substantially faster learning of CVAR policies in a lot of our uh, in all of our simulations. Thanks for your time, and I'm ha happy to answer questions. <laughs>